Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming today. <clears throat> this week, House Republicans are uh, hard at work advancing several important measures on the floor. Among these items, I want to highlight two bills that we are pushing to protect consumers and Americans' right to financial privacy, values I believe that everyone can actually get behind. The Financial Innovation and Technology for the 21st Century Act will protect consumers and encourage innovation by creating a regulatory framework for digital asset markets through legislation. Again, the most important part, through legislation, not through regulators, which is one of the reasons this town is in such disarray. We are going to do this through legislation. Through transparency and disclosure requirements, the digital asset marketplace will be a better place and safer for participants and allow American innovation to thrive. I commend the financial services and agriculture committees for their work on this important legislation. We're also supporting the CBDCA Anti-Surveillance State Act, which is critical to blocking federal bureaucrats from creating a central bank digital currency and allowing a China-like reality in which our financial system could easily be weaponized against Americans and allow the government to closely monitor every transaction and track consumer behaviors. Implementing a CBDC is simply un-American. These are, there are a few things that could, uh, that could totally infringe on our freedoms and autonomy, few things other than this type of currency and how it, this type of currency can be closely tracked, it can be withheld, it can be weaponized based on behaviors, causes, and of course, political leanings. I commend our Majority Whip, Tom Emmer, for his leadership on this bill, and I invite him to take the podium now. Thank you, Blake. This week, House Republicans, as, uh, as Blake just said, are going to take action to safeguard our American values by passing uh, my bill, the uh, CBDC, uh, or uh, the Central Bank Digital Currency Anti-Surveillance State Act. With this uh, legislation, we're going to stop unelected bureaucrats in the Biden administration from using a central bank digital currency, again, a CBDC, that threatens to destroy the American way of life. Unlike decentralized digital assets such as Bitcoin, CBDCs are a digital form of sovereign currency designed, issued, and monitored by the federal government. In short, a CBDC is a government-controlled, programmable money that, if not designed to be just like cash, open, permissionless, and private with a capital P, it not only could, it will give the federal government significant transaction uh, level data on individuals and the ability to suppress uh, politically unpopular activity. We've already seen examples of foreign governments weaponizing their financial system against their citizens. In China, the Communist Party actually has the digital yuan that is being used to monitor its citizens and they are building social scores based on behaviors. Uh, again, that's an anti-American approach. Close to home in the Western Hemisphere, Canada uh, froze the bank accounts of hundreds of truckers uh, protesting the vaccine mandate in 2022. If you think it can happen, think again. It has and it will if we allow this to happen here. It's naive to believe that your government will not weaponize the tools that it has to control you. This may be why the Biden administration issued an executive order placing urgency on CBDC research and development. All signals point towards this administration developing a CBDC that can and will be used to surveil and control Americans. The Federal Reserve has even described it. Don't listen to them when they tell you that they're not doing anything. The Federal Reserve has already described CBDCs as one of their key duties in a document that was provided to my office. In doing this, the Biden administration has proven they are itching to trade Americans' right to privacy for a CCP-style surveillance tool. House Republicans are not going to let that happen. 165 members of our conference have co-sponsored our CBDC Anti-Surveillance State Act, and it has gar garnered wide industry support. This bill ensures that Congress, not the administration uh, or the administrative state more uh, specifically, retains the authority over the United States digital currency policy so that it reflects our American values of privacy, individual sovereignty, and free market competitiveness. If not open, permissionless, and private, again, with a capital P, like cash, a CBDC 
is nothing more than a big government surveillance tool that will be weaponized to oppress Americans' freedom uh, and right to, to privacy. I encourage all of my colleagues, Republican and Democrat, to support this bill, which protects innovation and defense against an ever-expanding government surveillance state. With that, I, leave, I yield to our majority leader. Well, I applaud the work that the whip has done on this legislation we're bringing to the floor this week. We have two bills that are limiting the ability for unelected bureaucrats in Washington to control digital currency. It's become more and more popular amongst people, not just here in the United States, but around the world who believe in the dollar as a strong uh, way to, to fund things, as a strong way to conduct commerce. Uh, but if they want to have digital currency, they don't want to have the government tracking their transactions. And it's important uh, that we make it clear with these bills that we're bringing to the floor this week uh, that that's what the rules of the game will be going forward. And it puts limitations on the Biden administration's desire to control those transactions and track people's spending habits. And you've seen it over and over again by this Biden administration. Uh, by the way, the same Biden administration that is trying to double the size of the IRS to go and target people that are making well under $100,000 and force them to pay more in taxes, even when they're already paying more than their fair share. President Biden wants to get more from them by doubling the size of the IRS. So needless to say, we're going to continue to fight for those consumers bringing bills like this to the floor. Another bill we're bringing to the floor this week would prevent people here illegally from voting in D.C. elections. This is something that the D.C. Council passed a few years ago to create an ability for people here illegally to vote in elections. Uh, if you look at this massive flow of illegals coming into our country still to this day because of President Biden's open border, we've seen millions of people come into our country illegal. Minimum number is 8 million. It could be well, well above that number. People on the terrorist watch list coming into our country. You know, why should somebody at the Russian embassy be able to vote in elections here in the United States of America? Yet that is what is allowed today. We have a bill that says no, that's not the case. If somebody from Russia or from China working at the embassy in China wants to vote, they can vote in their own country's elections. They shouldn't be able, as a citizen of China, be able to vote in America's elections, for goodness sakes. Uh, and that's something I think most Americans agree with. We're going to find out who here in Congress agrees with that when we have a vote on that bill tomorrow. Something that we have been united against is not only the growing anti-Semitism and the growing movement against Israel's right to self-defense, which we have strongly supported. But now you see the International Criminal Court trying to arrest the prime minister of Israel for defending his country against a terrorist organization who on October 7th engaged war in barbaric ways against the people of Israel. Uh, this is a rogue agency. I know uh, this this majority has taken many, uh, many uh, steps against it. We're going to continue to take actions. But we also are calling on our friends around the world that are helping fund the ICC uh, to stop funding an organization that has become heavily anti-Israel and ultimately be anti-American, too, if they had that opportunity. Um, somebody who would probably talk more about that is our speaker, Mike Johnson. <clears throat> Yeah. All right. Thank, thank you, Mr. Leader and uh, Whip, and, and our Vice Chairman, Blake Moore, is filling in for Elise, who's a little under the weather this morning, our conference chair. Uh, glad y'all are here. Lots of things going on around the world. And let me address first, it's top of mind for us, uh, the, uh, the death of the, uh, the passing of Iran's president. Uh, we would just say clearly that the world is a little bit safer place this morning because of that. He was a, a clearly a malign force. Uh, to the Iranian people and to Israel and the West. While he engaged in torture and terror, the International Criminal Court, I think it's important to note this morning, maybe ironically, they never targeted him or even considered arresting him. But instead, what we see right now is the ICC has chosen to target Israel with baseless and illegitimate arrest warrants, and it's attempting to equate Israel's just war for its existence with the horrific acts of the October 7th massacre. To us, this is just unconscionable. You have international bureaucrats. We're not going to allow them to use warfare to undermine state sovereignty or usurp the authority of democratic nations. America 
should punish the ICC and put Kareem Khan back in his place. And if the ICC is allowed to threaten Israel's leaders, we know that America will be next. There is a reason that we've never endorsed the International Criminal Court, because it is a direct affront to our own sovereignty. We don't put any international body among, among or above uh, American sovereignty, and, and Israel does that, doesn't do that either. Uh, Congress is reviewing all of our options right now. We have some very aggressive uh, legislation that we're going to push as, um, as quickly as possible. Uh, it will impose sanctions. Uh, and if the ICC moves forward with its absurd warrant arrest or, or request, um, this, will, uh, this is going to be an even bigger international problem. Uh, regarding the border, sadly, international bureaucrats are not the only ones trying to subvert the notion of state sovereignty. Our own Commander-in-Chief, Joe Biden, is continuing to undermine America's sovereignty through his open border policy. We got the latest report from the border this morning. Fox News' Bill Malusian reported that there were large groups of persons coming from Middle Eastern countries in China, uh, men of military age probably, and by, by just by um, appearance of military capability, just flowing right across the border into our country. The problem continues every single day. And now you have Senator Schumer who's trying to give his vulnerable members cover for this because they've created this catastrophe by voting on a bill which has already failed in the Senate. It may not even get 50 votes because it's a bad bill, and it's really a phony messaging exercise that's going to go nowhere. The House, of course, as we all know, we talk about in here all the time, we pass multiple bipartisan bills, by the way, to secure the border and deport criminal illegal immigrants including the Lake and Riley Act. But every single measure that we have sent to the Senate has been blocked by Senator Schumer. If he was serious in his attempt to secure the border, Senator Schumer would bring up H.R. 2, the Secure the Border Act, which, as you all know, was the most uh, comprehensive border security bill ever passed by Congress that we did now more than 13 months ago. It's been sitting on Chuck Schumer's desk. If they were serious, they would move that legislation through the Senate and get it to the president's desk, and he would sign it into law. But they are not serious about it because they engineered the open border. Do not ever forget, we documented 64, at least 64 specific executive actions that President Biden himself took beginning on the first day he walked in the Oval Office and that his agencies uh, at DHS under the direction of Secretary Mayorkas, whom we impeached in the House, um, that they engineered. They opened the border wide. They did it intentionally. They're not serious about the issue. Many Democrats, many leading Democrats here in Washington want illegal aliens in our country. Why? So they can become voters and they can affect the outcome of the census in six years um, to affect reapportionment in Congress. Now, if you want example of that, look at, at uh, the District of Columbia. That's what um, Leader Scalise was mentioning. The city council has decided they want non-citizens and foreign actors deciding who will serve as mayor and the local attorney general here. As the body in charge of overseeing D.C., Congress will not support such lawless behavior. It's a violation of federal law. We're not going to let Russian spies and criminal aliens decide who runs our nation's capital. We're just not going to do it. And that's why the House is voting this week to reverse the dangerous decisions by the D.C. City Council and, and bar non-citizens from voting in D.C. elections. Uh, I, I was grateful when Congress and the White House work together to reverse D.C.'s dangerous revisions to the criminal code. And if, if this voting bill can't pass, everybody watch very closely. It's going to be proof, uh, proof positive that, that there are some Democrats who want illegal aliens deciding election outcomes. It's going to be clear they don't want Americans deciding American elections. Uh, with that, uh, we'll take a few questions. Yeah. What's next? Uh, we, we're working on that, uh, and it'll be coming to the floor soon. And the reason that we're doing that is because this is not about politics. You've heard that allegation. This is about this is about process. You have the judiciary and the oversight committees that are working together very carefully on this. And the purpose of getting the audio tapes of of the uh, the, the Biden interview is is because the committees have to do their legislative work. This is. They use the audio to evaluate the, the work and the accuracy of the special counsel. We have the transcript. There's nothing, should be no surprises here. <clears throat> and it's, um, it's very interesting to us that the president is trying to evoke executive privilege over that, which doesn't even apply here. This, this isn't covered by executive privilege. This is, not, uh, this is not the president receiving candid advice from his advisors while executing his presidential responsibilities. Remember, this was, um, well, an interview with his ghostwriter, 
and then sitting for an interview with a special prosecutor investigating he whether he himself the president criminally mishandled classified documents so the executive privilege doesn't even apply here <clears throat> and that's why uh, the contempt uh, is, is the, uh, the, the 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 measure that's appropriate here and i think it will pass the house handily Thank yes sir you. Mr. Speaker, has Israel's response to Hamas made Jews around the world safer? Uh, I, I'm not sure how to evaluate that question. I will tell you that Israel is in a fight, an existential war for their very existence. And, and Hamas has made clear they want to eliminate the state of Israel. Hamas is a proxy of Iran, who has said the same thing. Um, this is a high-stakes battle for the survival of a nation and, and, and our, our very close friend and ally, and a very important one. And it, it destabilizes uh, all global affairs. I mean, the Middle East is a tinderbox, and now you've got hot war going on there. Um, we have to stand with Israel unequivocally, and we have to protect and help do everything we can to protect uh, Jewish, the Jewish people. <clears throat> just because of their ethnicity on college campuses right now, they're, they're under physical threat just because of who they are. And that is not who we are as Americans. That's why we stood so strongly against that. That's why you, we stood here just uh, two weeks ago and announced that we're having a a whole of house approach and investigation on the funding streams to these universities that are allowing this madness to go on in these campuses. Um, we, we have to look at every uh, angle and every approach we can to, to stand with the Jewish people and stand with Israel in their time of great need, and we will continue to do that. House Republicans are going to do that consistently, um, and, and we'll, uh, that'll be a big theme here. Yeah, second row, yeah. Well, look, there's some great ideas on the table. Um, we, we're down to the fine points of that. I've spoken about it directly with Prime Minister Netanyahu on Friday, I think it was, and, and I'm scheduled to talk with him again today. Um, very clearly, this is a, a, a great threat uh, to the international community and to our allies and to us, ultimately, as I explained earlier. So uh, we're, we're getting down to the fine points of that, and hopefully it will be a, a, a bipartisan uh, bill and that everybody will be able to stand together on that. I think we need to send a strong message to the world that this is completely, wildly inappropriate and we're not going to stand for it. Second row, yeah. I, I don't have any reaction to that. I haven't seen the details of their statements or what they're proposing. I, th I would just say this. This is not the time for anybody in the international community, including our own president, to be stepping in uh, and, and trying to micromanage the affairs in Israel as they're trying to, as I said, fight for their very existence. I think we've got to be very careful about that. And um, th there will be lots of deliberate discussion about what's next after the war. Uh, and, and after this, you know, after peace is, um, is restored there. But I, I think it's premature to do that, and I'm, I'm not going to comment on that much any further. Yeah, Last money. Year, you, you've been very clear about your disdain for the hush money case, but what about the underlying alleged conduct of paying off a porn star to keep this extramarital affair allegedly quiet? You're a deeply religious man, a moral man. Does that alleged conduct any concern about the former I, look, I'm not going to comment on that. What we've, what we've said about what's happening in, in Manhattan is, uh, I've called it a disgrace because it is. It's clearly lawfare. They're clearly going after President Trump because of who he is, because he is a, you know, he'll soon to be officially the nominee of the Republican Party for President of the United States. They've had him tied up for weeks in a courthouse when he should be out have the ability to speak freely in the campaign uh, and to be around the country. Um, this, this is clearly by design. These prosecutors in these various locations are clearly have coordinated with the, the Department of Justice in Washington. Everybody knows what's going on. Everybody. If you look at this objectively, there's no way to, to uh, look at this in any other way. The case is patently absurd. You've had every, every legal analyst uh, across the board acknowledge as much. Um, it, needs to, uh, it, it needs to be handled quickly, and I, I hope that he will be fully acquitted there and we can move forward. But it, the, the damage has been done. They're doing real damage to our system of justice itself. And you've heard me say many times, that's my greatest concern. If the people in a constitutional republic do not trust that, that justice is, is fair and that you have equal justice under the law, then we lose a very important element of what it what it is required to maintain a republic like ours. And so we've got a lot, of, a lot of repair work to do, I think, to the institution itself and to our system of justice after this madness. So with that, we'll leave you. Thank you so much. Thank you.